Dear friends, welcome to the Fritur Foundation. My name is Knut Ola Romos. I'm director of Fritur. Um, I'm also chairing a government commission on, on uh, the future funding of the media in Norway, funding from the state. And uh, I'm happy to see um, not the whole commission here, but uh, the major part of it, and also in the panel. Um, this is uh, on the first row Nick Newman, associate fellow and uh, at the Reuters Institute and the lead author of the digital news report. And uh, Fritur is very proud to be cooperating with Reuters Institute for the study of journalism at the University of Oxford. A long name. Um, uh, we are cooperating, partnering in this event and uh, also other projects. And next Monday, September the 12th, uh, we have the annual application deadline for, uh, for the uh, so-called Preben Münte Fellowship. So if there are any Norwegian journalists here uh, wishing to spend half a year at the University of Oxford doing some uh, research and <laughs> other things uh, with <laughs> competent, competent supervisors, uh, we, have, we have a very good scholarship to, to to, uh, to throw after you uh, for six months. <laughs> uh, um, Cecil Darlan, financial affairs journalist, was uh, our last fellow, and before her, Mal Ghali, who, uh, who has written uh, during that period on ISIL's uh, propaganda strategies and also a book. Are any of you here, Mark or uh, Cecil? No. I wanted them to ask you if you could recommend six months in Oxford. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, from, uh, from this year, uh, Fritur is also a co-founder of the Digital News Report, financing uh, and making possible uh, uh, to include Norway in the report for the first time. And that's why we are here this afternoon. Um, the rest of the world, when it comes to media development, is interesting enough, but we we'll concentrate on, uh, on uh, Norwegian trends and, and contrasting them to, uh, to global trends and uh, results from uh, other countries. Uh, the uh, Reuters Institute Digital News Report is very special. It compares the situation in altogether 26 countries after service, including 50,000 people. And uh, we had uh, a dozen of, uh, of, uh, of the analog uh, hardback paper paper version. Uh, I would have thought that most of you wanted to read it uh, digitally, and, and I guess you do, but um, uh, uh, it is possible to order the paper version and, uh, and you'll find the, the whole thing in, in, in the Reuters Institute uh, website. There are so many questions. Which similarities, which different patterns can we, can we see? And for example, why are a considerably higher degree of media users willing to pay for digital news in Norway than in any other country. To discuss this question and uh, several other important questions with us and all of you in the audience, we have a very competent panel joining uh, Nick Newman and myself, Espen Egil Hansen, uh, Editor-in-Chief and, uh, and uh, CEO of Aftenposten, Hildegun Sodal, uh, Vice President for Strategic um, Partnerships in Aller Media Group, um, Halva Mo, uh, Professor of Media Studies at the University of Bergen. Unfortunately, uh, Tor Jamen Eriksen, the, the uh, uh, CEO of NRK, uh, had to go to Paralympics um, in Rio. But uh, he appointed a very good substitute, Anders Hofset, uh, journalist and strategic analyst at uh, NRK Beta, uh, working with uh, NRK's digital strategy. And uh, for half a year, he was a research, a journalist fellow at the Reuters Institute. And he has, in fact, uh, written the text about Norway in this year's uh, digital news report. Uh, I also regret that Ida Orlen had to cancel earlier today due to urgent private matters. Uh, this uh, event will, will be video recorded. You are, uh, you are free to, to, to say 
uh, anything you want, but uh, it, it will be recorded and uh, might be <laughs> used against you. <laughs> well, we'll now listen to a presentation, 20-25 minutes by Nick Newman. As I said, he's an associate fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, where he does research and writing on the future of digital media. He's also then the lead author of this digital news report and an author of an influential annual report detailing trends at the intersection of technology and journalism. And he played a key role for many years in shaping the BBC's internet services, more than a decade, and was a founding member of the BBC News website, leading international coverage as BBC's world editor for, from uh, 1997 to 2001. And uh, his, uh, his CV at BBC is uh, much longer. Among other things, he wrote the BBC's first social media strategy. <laughs> And today you are helping uh, companies, media companies like the Finnish Yle, Financial Times and The Economist with uh, digital product strategies. After Nick's introduction, we'll, um, we'll have a short discussion in the panel and with our panel, moderated by, by Nick and me, and then we'll open up for, the, for all you in the audience uh, to take part. So please, Nick, we look forward to, to your presentation. Thank you, Knut, for that uh, fantastic introduction and uh, introduction also to the Reuters Institute, so I, I, I will get straight into the data. Uh, also, just to say that um, we're really, really uh, happy to uh, include Norway for the first time and uh, would like to thank very much Frit Ord for their, for their support in what is um, you know, an ever-growing uh, and complex international project. So, um, as Knut was saying, 50,000 people this year, uh, 26 countries, we started with five. Next year, we're gonna be doing over 30 countries. Uh, the countries are, are listed here. Uh, so these are some of the European countries that we added in the last 12 months, including Norway, which means effectively, we've got full, full, pretty much full coverage of, uh, of most European countries, or certainly the most populous European uh, countries. And then outside Europe, uh, we've added Turkey, South Korea, uh, Canada to uh, some of uh, so Japan, the US, Australia and Brazil, which we've been doing for a, a number of years now. I should also, just as a preface, say that um, it's based on a survey, an online poll. Uh, so it is representative of those people who are online, not necessarily of national populations. So that's kind of important. As, as such, it will tend to underrepresent traditional news behaviors such as TV print, uh, and radio when we talk about cross-platform behavior. Um, probably slightly less in Norway than other countries because you have such high uh, internet penetration. Uh, and we're incredibly grateful to a range of, uh, of sponsors. Uh, we've talked about uh, a number of them already, but they include uh, Google, the BBC, uh, news organizations, and a number of sort of foundations as well. Uh, this is the fifth year we've run the report. So it's what, what, what I really love about it is that we're starting to get really interesting historical trend data. Uh, to do that, we obviously have to ask exactly the same questions every year. Uh, and then we supplement that every year by deep dives into very specific areas. So this year we've looked at uh, ad blocking, we looked at trust in much more detail. And we've combined survey questions by also asking people, uh, doing some focus groups in a number of countries. And I'll refer to some of that as we go along. Um, so to the main findings of, of this year's report, and I'm going to talk about uh, the Norwegian findings, but I will set them in the context of those wider global, uh, global findings uh, and trying to give you a sense of where Norway fits in, where it's uh, special, uh, where it's the same. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about um, the growth of distributed content, uh, so more people using social media not just for discovery, but crucially now for consumption within those platforms. I'll talk about that. Smartphones taken uh, another really huge leap forward over the last, last year, uh, and the implications in terms of content and discovery, uh, I'll, I'll touch on those. In terms of the business issues, uh, I've mentioned already, we'll talk about ad blocking, who's doing it, the extent of it, uh, but also those pay questions that Knut was talking about there. 
Video is really interesting. Um, so we find that it's not growing as fast as perhaps many people in the room might hope or as many people uh, have expected. Though we are, uh, I'll talk a lot about the growth off-site of video consumption. And then finally, we've done a lot on uh, the role of brands in a much more fragmented and complex digital environment. So how much do brands still matter? Why do they still matter? Uh, and I'll talk about that. So firstly, uh, that move to distributed news and the rise of platforms. So we've really hit a landmark over the last 12 months, I think, with over half now of our global sample, 51%, now saying they use social media as a source of news at least once a week as a source of news. Uh, and as you can see from the chart on the left, in those countries that we've been tracking for some time, that you can see really significant growth. So pretty much doubling in about in about four years in most of those countries. So I think just Spain as an example, 28% to 60% since 2013. Uh, pretty much all, all of those. Uh, obviously, we don't have trend data for Norway or many of the other Nordic countries, um, but. Essentially, uh, all of them are just above the global uh, average, uh, so 54%. Um, so that probably relates partly to the fact that more people are online in, in those countries, and so the numbers are a little bit higher, rather than Norway is particularly exceptional. Uh, as a comparator, I think Brazil is something like 70 or 80%, so they're using social media for news, so that's, a, that's the edge case. Uh, if you look at it by age, you can see um, that more than a quarter of young people, so that's uh, the, uh, so overall 12%, 12 so when we ask people what their main source of news is, what their preferred source of news, one in 10, so 12% now say social media, rather than television or printed newspaper or radio, uh, is, is their main most important source of news. The figure is slightly lower in Norway, about 8%. Uh, but if you look at it by age, uh, you can see that, that a quarter of young people, so, so 18 to 24s, 28% uh, say that social media is more important than television for the first time. So 24% say television. And again, that's the same in Norway. So 20% 20, 20 say of 18 to 24s say social media is the main way in which they get news and, and fewer say that uh, television news is. Uh, more generally, social media as a main source is up in pretty much every country substantially that, that we look at. And part of the reason is the way in which social media has been incorporating a whole load of, of new native formats within uh, the, the networks themselves. So here's just a couple of examples of some video formats that were used extensively and consumed within those social networks uh, on Facebook and, and, and Twitter. So people didn't need to go anywhere else. They were consuming within the social network itself. And obviously the trend in the last year to um, Facebook promoting instant articles and other formats where you don't need to go anywhere else uh, is part of this trend to people consuming within those platforms. This is one of the many comments from the focus groups that summed up the change. This is from the US focus group. So this is somebody saying the stories that come through on his Facebook feed are usually the breaking stories I would otherwise have had to go to the New York Times for and now I don't. So you know, essentially the, the, the social network itself is enabling him to get more of the content that he wants without having to go somewhere else. In terms of what we mean by social media, it's clear that Facebook is dominant, both in itself but also in the other companies it, it owns. So uh, corporately it owns WhatsApp and Instagram, two of the fastest growing networks. Um, what these figures relate to, the blue, is the people who say that they use each network for news. So uh, that's for finding news, discussing news, sharing news, consuming news. 44% uh, there for, for Facebook. Uh, and the yellow line is using those networks for any purpose. So you can see that two thirds of, of, of Facebook users are using Facebook for news. Uh, we see this pattern with Facebook dominant in pretty much every country that we look at. Uh, in terms of Norway, uh, you can see that pretty much in line with uh, with the uh, general trends, so Facebook for news, 45% compared with 44%. Slightly less use of YouTube for news, slightly less use of Twitter for news than in some other countries. Um, but interestingly to me at least, Instagram and, and, and Snapchat are much more heavily used in Norway than some other countries, uh, particularly 
uh, Snapchat. Uh, you can maybe explain why this is. Um, but higher than pretty much every, any other country we look at, apart from the US, uh, with 7% of under 35 saying they're using Snapchat for news. Uh, this is about 1% of the UK, for example, so this is, this is, this is uh, substantially different. This brings us on to why people are using social media for news. So these are the three key reasons that came out of our sort of focus groups. Firstly, being alerted that the fact that um, you don't need to go out looking, that it comes to you through social media. Uh, it's a very easy way to discover news through social media. That's the most important way. Secondly, convenience. So 50% say that social media is just easy. It brings together lots of news from different sources. Instead of having to go off to this website, that website, it just makes it really, really simple. And then the third point is about the social aspects, that it's also possible to share and discuss with your friends. I think this is a really interesting chart to think about for, for traditional media companies. How good are you at satisfying each of these different aspects, which are really fundamental and useful and important for, for general users. So although we talk about social media, the move to distributed content is also about uh, <coughs> other kinds of aggregators, other kinds of news aggregators. And uh, what's interesting is when we look across the 26 countries, there's many, many different models out there. Uh, so some countries have uh, the predominant way in which people get news is through really large news aggregators. So in Korea and Japan, uh, you have companies like Naver and, and Yahoo with something like 60% of people accessing those every week. And publishers are actually going, making sure that their content is published within those platforms, which is where it is consumed. This is a little bit like Facebook and instant articles in, in some other parts of the world. We have something similar going on in places like Poland and the Czech Republic, very, very powerful platforms like uh, Onet, uh, Sunstam, which is also a search engine in the Czech Republic. Um, but in Norway, in UK, in Germany, we have far less of this. Uh, we do have some aggregators. Uh, there's a couple listed here, here for Norway, and significant numbers of people are using them as a way of discovering content. But it's nothing like the, the, the same as, as the ones over here but they are still significant and important part of the, uh, of the picture. The other thing which has happened over the last uh, year or so is the growth of new mobile aggregators specifically, and um, Apple News being the obvious one, but Flipboard and some of these other. Uh, and we're very interested to know, compared with Facebook, compared with these national aggregators, how important are these? Uh, what we just looked at three countries here, UK, US and Australia, with Apple News, because Apple News has only been launched uh, in those three countries, and then uh, Flipboard and Smart News, which we looked at across the countries. But you can see there, three, four percent, we found that quite surprisingly low numbers of people who are using it compared with, uh, with Facebook. So when we're talking about distributed news, a lot of it is really those social networks, uh, and Facebook in particular. Of course, the, um, the big question is, does it matter if news is increasingly accessed through these intermediaries rather than directly uh, from, from the news websites itself? Does it weaken the brand connection and, by implication, the ability to forge direct relationships with, with users? So this year we asked people if, when they were in social media or in one of these news aggregators, did they notice the brand? Did they remember the brand that they were using? And what we find is people notice about half the time. So about half the time people don't say they don't notice the brand that actually created the content. Uh, what's interesting is if you look down here, Japan and Korea, where aggregation is the predominant way that people get their news, people notice the brands even less. So uh, if in Norway and other countries we see a further move to news being consumed within platforms like Facebook, then potentially that's quite concerning for publishers in terms of having that direct um, connection. Moving on to mobile, and as I mentioned earlier, we've had a very, another very strong year in most countries of rising smartphone use along with an actual fall, an actual fall in computer use. This is the general picture of smartphones over the last four years, again, and just in some of those countries we've been tracking for that period of time. Overall, about 50%, about half of us say we use the smartphone for news at least once a week in most countries. There are a few countries, uh, Korea, Sweden, Switzerland, which are now mobile majority. More access via smartphone than a computer or laptop combined. And if we look at uh, Norway, again, 
right on that upper edge, so pretty much on the tipping point. 64% say they're using the smartphone for news weekly compared with 66% who are using the computer, so uh, pretty much on, on that tipping point. Uh, just drilling down a little bit more at the UK, it's useful to see how things have changed. This is similar in most countries. So actually, people, although people have as many computers, they're using the computer less for news. It's actually declined over time. The smartphone continues to rise very fast. And what's interesting is that the tablet, after peaking in 2015, has actually started to fall. Again, penetration is probably level, but people are using the tablet less for news, partly because of larger smartphones, which is not necessarily where we thought we would be a few years ago when the tablet was billed as the saviour of the news industry. And then uh, that's, the, that's the, the UK's tipping point. So the combination now of tablet and smartphone has overtaken um, the computer as the main source of news. Um, of course, this is important not just because the formats and display is different on mobile, but because the way people access news on a mobile is different as well. And this chart is slightly complicated, but what it's basically uh, looking at is the importance of people who are entering directly on the left, branded entry, through news websites or apps, so slightly higher than people who enter through social media, and then looking at it depending on which, which device you're going on. And broadly what this shows is um, when you're going directly, you're less likely to go directly uh, to a brand. So you're less likely to go directly and you're more likely to go um, via social when using a smartphone. So essentially smartphones and uh, social media are going hand in hand. Uh, just one example, um, uh, one interesting question is, is what do people do first thing in the morning? So uh, that's, that gives a sense of, 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 in many ways, the most important source of news. So we looked at um, smartphones, internet, against radio, television, online. We say, where do you go first for news? Where do you get your news first? This is just UK and US. Uh, we didn't ask this in Norway. Um, and what you're seeing, radio is very popular in the UK. People, a lot of people turn on the radio in the morning. Uh, the smartphone is catching up. So 60, al almost 16% say the first thing they do in terms of news is smartphone. In the US, the smartphone's way ahead of radio. Uh, television's more, more, more important in the morning in the US. But then the question was, what do you do then? So if you're using your smartphone, where do you go next? So what's your first contact with news? And in the US, uh, over half are going straight to social media. So again, this link with social media. When you're picking up your smartphone, the first thing you'll do is checking your social media feeds, and that's where your first contact with news is. Only 23% are going directly to a news app. What happens in the US doesn't necessarily happen in European countries. That's one of the things we've learned very strongly from, from, the, um, uh, from the digital news report over the last five years. In the UK, you see a very different picture. So still a third of people, the first thing they do is go to uh, social media, to Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, that's about half for young people. Obviously, young people are using that much more. Uh, but still half, 48%, are going directly to a, a news app. And a lot of that is to do with the strength of brands in the UK, particularly the strength of the BBC, which is the predominant digital brand in the, in the UK as well. Um, there's been a huge amount of excitement about video, about news video over the last year. So a lot of investment from news organisations, um, a lot of hope that uh, that will bring in more commercial revenue. Uh, but against that backdrop, we find still surprisingly slow growth and significant variations across countries as well. So this basically, the, the question we ask is, have you, you, have you accessed a news video, at least one news video, over the last week? And what we find is 33% uh, in, in the US and Canada, so that's at the top end. And then uh, down here you have Japan and Denmark, somewhere around 15%, uh, so about half as many people say that they access video here. Norway is uh, somewhere in the middle there, 23%, so pretty much on, 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 the, uh, on, on the average. And the growth that we've seen, there is some growth, but it's much smaller than I was expecting, given the huge explosion we've seen on the supply side. So a three percentage point increase in the US, one percentage point increase in the UK since last year. There's another tracker question we ask every year, which is, um, do, you, uh, do, you mostly, do, uh, do you mostly read or do you most, mostly use video? And 78% uh, say they either never watch a news video online 
or only occasionally when it adds context uh, to, to the story. So 78% say never or only occasionally uh, use a news video. So what I take away from this is people are still incredibly wedded to, to text. And when, when we ask why this is, um, in the focus groups, uh, people's, the number one reason is that, uh, no, this was not focus groups, this was actually the survey. The number one reason is being quicker and more convenient. So text is just a quicker way to get to the information people want. The second reason is dislike of pre-roll advertisements, uh, which is very strong and has increased in a number of countries over the last uh, few years. Uh, we were having a discussion earlier about whether the, the industry itself is putting the right pre-rolls ahead of, uh, of news content, whether it's the right size, whether they've adapted it appropriately. And then uh, video is not adding to the story, which kind of relates to the first point there. Another key finding is that for those people who are watching news videos, in many countries, uh, a majority is now happening off-site, not on, um, so on those platforms I was talking about before, you know, primarily Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and this is most true for those countries that are using social media most. So Brazil, I talked about, Greece, use a lot of social media, and obviously younger people as well. In most countries, including Norway, most people are consuming off news videos off-site rather than on-site. Um, and even in those countries where people are consuming more off-site, like the UK, Finland, uh, and Norway, uh, off-site video consumption is still at a very, very significant level in comparison. So video formats are really at the heart of this distributed content revolution. So moving on to the, uh, some of the business issues uh, now. So firstly, ad blocking. Uh, so I think there was a report out recently said the cost of the global uh, industry was something like $3.8 billion a year and set to climb. Uh, our data shows very high levels of ad blocking uh, in most countries, 38% at one end, Poland, and uh, at the other end, uh, we have Japan and Korea at sort of 12 and 10%. Norway, again, pretty much you, you're just on the average in so many of these things, pretty much on the average at 23%. 3, 3%. Um, we find that pretty much everyone who's downloaded um, an ad blocker is actually using them. So what we suggest that once you have an ad blocker, you very rarely go back. Uh, young people are also much more likely to use an ad blocker and heavy news users are also much more likely to use an ad blocker. Uh, the one bit of good news for the publishing industry is that on mobiles, uh, ad blocking is still relatively rare, so only 8% on average are using, of smartphone users are using ad blockers. I think it's much, much higher for, for desktop computers, so it's just currently a little bit too difficult uh, to do. And in terms of reasons why are people ad blocking, uh, so the first two relate to the intrusive nature of online advertising. So just the sheer amount of it, uh, fed up with the volume and distracting nature of investments in general, so something like 70%. We did ask this question in Norway, very similar results. Um, and the second one is, is more about privacy, which is more important in some countries than others. So they dislike um, the, the, the way in which ad tech is currently practiced, that, it, that those ads don't feel, feel relevant to them. Uh, and then in terms of paying for news, so this is a chart we show every year and uh, on the whole we find a continued reluctance to pay for online news in general compared, compared to the historic percentages who bought newspapers. Uh, but quite a wide variation in terms of those percentages. So as Knut was saying earlier, uh, Norway and indeed most Nordic countries are right at the top end of that. Uh, in terms of headline percentage, so 27% uh, in Norway say that they have paid in the last week for some form of online news, so the highest in, in Europe. I guess we're going to discuss why that is. Um, I can suppose it's to do with strong reading traditions in, um, in Nordic countries, uh, traditionally very high level subscriptions as well, so transferring those print subscriptions to digital has been easier and also much lower levels of competition than we see in, in many English-speaking countries. There is so much free news, there is so much competition, it's that much harder for English-speaking countries, uh, for, for news organisations to charge for news. Uh, so the most, the English-speaking countries are, are, are flagged there in orange, so the most we see there is, is 10%. Um, I think I've just split, split. The only other thing to say is Norway also uh, has amongst the highest percentage of ongoing subscriptions and some of the highest uh, levels 
of, um, of payment, average payment of all the countries that we look at. Uh, so moving on to, um, to trust uh, in journalism and um, we asked a range of questions about trust this year, about the news in general, in news organisations and also in journalists. And what we see is generally uh, stronger trust in Western European and Nordic countries, uh, lower in the US in particular, sort of fairly close to the bottom. So again, pretty big differences. 33% say they trust the news in general in the US and uh, much higher. So Norway there is, uh, the Nordic countries, relatively high levels of, of, of trust. Um, uh, the other thing this chart shows is there's very little difference between trust in the news in general and trust in news organisations, which is the, the blue line. And um, so, in, in, in other words, in most countries, it's the news brand rather than the journalist with its heritage and its values that people identify with more than individual journalists. So in the US, you have a whole load of, of brands and companies that are essentially journalist-driven brands. We see much less of that here in Europe, where the trust is still basically through the, the, the brand itself. Uh, and this issue of trust in journalism is particularly relevant to the debate about distributed content in terms of whether um, journalists, uh, people trust journalists anymore to make the right selections or actually whether algorithms might be a better way of selecting the news. And we asked specifically about this year, this year whether algorithms or editors were a good way to select news and what we found was uh, there was a more positive attitude to algorithms that take the ones that take into account what you've read before than there is in, 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 in journalists and editorial selection, which slightly surprised us. So second was journalists, and then finally was selections based on what your friends have read. So my interpretation of this is that people trust themselves most, and then they trust experts so-called experts, journalists, and then lastly, they trust inexpert friends. But obviously that changes if the friends happen to be expert in something, in which case they trust that more. So it's, it's quite complicated. Um, however, while, while people see the benefits of personalization and algorithms that, have read, uh, that know what you've read, they also uh, really, uh, sorry, these are some of the reasons um, why? So people prefer algorithms because if it can give me suggestions, it's tailoring to my needs, so that personalization. Uh, some people prefer editors. It provides more variety, and it can get boring if, if, if I only see things I like. So actually, people are quite confused, and people want both uh, editorial selection and, and serendipity. And people say, uh, this came out very strongly in Norway, actually, uh, people say that they're really worried about missing important information. So if we have more news that's recommended by our friends or what we've read, are we really getting to different kinds of news or challenging news? And people are really uh, very concerned about these issues. Again, we may pick up this, in, this issue in the, in the panel. So finally, just a bit more on brands. Um, so overall, we find that the vast majority of content is still, in most countries, produced by traditional brands. Uh, but we also see uh, uh, digital-born brands growing, go, uh, becoming more important. So this is, a, this is averaged across all countries, but in some countries, like Norway, we'll see that in a minute, actually newspapers uh, are um, winning digitally. In some countries like the UK, it's the broadcaster brands that are like the BBC that are doing best. Uh, and in some countries like the US, some of these digital brands are beginning to, uh, to, to really take over. Uh, particularly, we've looked at uh, Huffington Post and BuzzFeed as examples of that, but I, I also talked about some of the aggregators. Um, if we look at, at, at Norway in particular, um, there, we can see far less impact of those digital-born brands. So one of the really interesting things for me out of this chart is that the, the top five, so on the left-hand side, what you have is the percentage of people who say that they access each of these brands weekly. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have those accessing through traditional television, radio, or print, with NRK at, at the top. Uh, but essentially, it's the same top five <coughs> big brands on digital as well, but just in a different order. So you have uh, VG and Doug, Doug Ladder, uh, NRK number three. Uh, and that's... That's very different from what we see in other countries. So uh, in, 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 
a lot of countries we see a much more fragmented digital environment because there's much more competition. In Norway, probably again to do with the smaller size, um, it's actually a smaller number of brands and in many cases it's the same brands. So we do have the Huffington Post at 8% and obviously uh, you now have access to international brands like BBC News Online uh, very, very easily, so that's, that's making an impact as well. But fundamentally people are using the same, same type of brands but in different ways. Uh, which, I, which I think is, uh, is, is really interesting. Um, the other thing to say is N NRK does uh, significantly worse online compared with offline, um, though it is uh, reaching younger audience through, through digital as well. And that's, so if you look at the demographic breakdowns, uh, NRK uh, is not getting so many young people on uh, on television as, as it used to, so it's got a, a significant problem with young people watching television news, whereas digitally uh, it's getting some more of those, of, of those young people. So this is true for all public service broadcasters that are really struggling with uh, the move to digital, is news organisations, newspapers are trying to stop them, um, but they need to get those younger audiences and those younger audiences are online. So this is the sort of a real dilemma in this era of convergence about how to deal with this issue of public service broadcasters and what rights they have. Um, what's interesting when you probe further, and you ask about um, uh, and you ask about main sources of news in general, it, in pretty much every country, it is those serious news brands that people use most regularly, or have the most loyalty to. That say it is their main source of news. Um, so, on these lists, you don't see Huffington Post or BuzzFeed as, as main sources of news for most people, even for young people. It tends to be those brands with a track record that carry the trust, uh, particularly when you're important, talking about serious or important sources of news. And in our focus groups, I really like this quote. Uh, people talk about you kind of have serious news source and then you have a sort of guilty pleasure source. And maybe in the old days, that was all combined in one package and you read the serious news and the, in, in a digital world, you go to some organisations when there's something really big and significant happening, and you'll get a bit of fun and entertainment in the downtime uh, from some of these, uh, these newer brands. So I think that is one you know, really significant difference from di from, with digital. Um, so um, in, in whether traditional brands, news brands still matter, so people may not be prepared to pay for them, but they, in the focus groups, they certainly still like the idea of them. So that identity, that track record, that need to have information that you, you, can, you can trust at important moments, that still really, really resonates with people, young people and old people. Uh, they feel that uh, they somehow they need these brands to check accurate information against uh, crucially. So that came up again and again in the focus groups. Especially when you know, the chips are down, uh, that reputation, the combination of the history and the distinctiveness that really, really still matters to people. So, um, some good news, I think, and some bad news in here for, uh, for traditional media companies. So, just, um, just a quick recap, uh, and maybe some questions that we can pick up now in, in the discussion. So, more of us are getting news through social networks uh, and platforms. Does this matter? How, how, how do publishers deal with the rise of these intermediaries? Uh, mobile news, news consumption becoming much more important. How does that change the nature of content itself? Uh, is it the same stuff, or, or actually do, do news organisations need to think completely differently about the type of content they produce for mobile devices? We now have editors competing with algorithms for the right to select stories. What does that mean for journalists? Do, do news organisations need to invest in algorithms as well? How does this work in the future? Video is growing, but how fast and how far will that go? Should publishers remain focused on text or, or pivot towards really investing in video? Is that the future or is it going to be a mix of those things? And then finally, traditional news brands are still hugely valued, but people aren't prepared to pay for them or watch ads in many cases. Uh, so what are the implications of that for the news industry, for profitability, for plurality, all of these issues? Uh, so some big questions and... Uh, I think we should have an interesting discussion. Thank you very much.